Welcome, everybody, to TACOM and CMS Partnership ICD-10 Training to Assist Small Physician Practice Managers. Thank you, everybody, for making this a priority. Um, it is coming, and our philosophy is being prepared it is the path to the least um, disruption and least cost to you and your practice. We're very, very happy to be working closely with CMS. Um, as they are dedicated to making sure that they can do everything possible to make it easier for small practices to come on board. And with that, I'd like to move forward and introduce our speaker for today. Denicia Green is a Senior Health Insurance Specialist, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Ms. Green's 15 years of healthcare experience spans over a wide variety of CMS programs and policy, including Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, Program Integrity, Audit, Quality, Public Ambulation Health, Health IT, Health Insurance Exchanges, and most recently, our favorite for today, ICD-10 Implementation and Oversight. With that, welcome Denicia Green. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I, I am so excited to be a part of this session today. Um, it's, PACOM is just a wonderful organization, and um, we really want to make sure that we have many more of these sessions, number one, and also to make sure that they are tailored um, to your needs. Um, thank you for all the work that you're out there doing. We know that um, it takes time to join some sessions. We want to talk to you today about some things for ICD-10 and get a sense from you as to what you would like to hear about, what topics um, are of interest, um, the challenges that you may be going through. And as we're hearing about those things, we can certainly, certainly tailor ongoing um, technical assistance and training sessions for you. With that, we'll go ahead and start with our um, ICD-10 update. Next slide, please. So in terms of the compliance date, um, we are set for October 1, 2014, a firm date. And as a matter of fact, our administrator, uh, Marilyn Tavner, mentioned this recently at an, a, a recent HIMSS conference. Um, and uh, everyone was really glad that CMS um, really firmed up this date and it showed alignment across uh, uh, HHS and as well as the industry that we're moving forward with ICD-10 implementation. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. All right, and so what is ICD-10? Many of you are aware um, of what ICD-10 does. It talks about a patient's state of health. It's the diagnosis code. Many of you use it in your practice um, uh, to send in your claims for reimbursement purposes, but ICD-10 also serves other purposes, and we'll get into that a little bit later today to talk about how ICD-10 is being used not only in your practice, but also um, across um, health departments and uh, for public health purposes and research and other areas. Uh, next slide, please. What we know about ICD-10 is, again, it, it has a wide impact. It really focuses around advancing health care. And so um, ICD-10 has a more specific code. It, it allows you to diagnose a, a patient's um, specific diagnosis. So for example, if you have a patient with a broken leg, we can now look at left leg, right leg. We can also get into some of the very specific areas um, of, of their diagnosis and whether it has been tied to a history um, of, of uh, a particular uh, disease or state. Um, so it does give you a lot of information about the patient and their health. In terms of ICD-10 advances in medicine and medical term, uh, technology, actually, um, ICD-9 is a full code set. It, 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 the, the system itself is full, um, and right now it does not allow for um, us to capture any type of new procedure, um, whereas ICD-10 allows for any new technologies, any new medical procedures um, that uh, have been identified, and so 
it is not a um, ICD ACD9, excuse me, is not viable to continue um, in an e-health environment. It's not viable to continue any new innovative um, approaches to healthcare. And so we are moving beyond that, and we need a system and a code set that also supports the sort of modernization of healthcare. So ICD-10 also improves data for quality reporting. Here at CMS, we are working closely with our EHR uh, folks to uh, connect ICD-10 in terms of quality reporting. So for our physician quality reporting uh, measures, there are measures that you may select that include an ICD code, and in those cases, you would need to report an ICD-10 code going forward after the October 1, 2014 date. Also, many of you may have an EHR system where you're using, um, let's just say SNOMED in particular. Um, you would need to convert that over to um, those SNOMED codes over to ICD-10 in order to receive reimbursement. So we just wanted to make sure that you know that if you have an EHR in place and you are using um, the SNOMED terminology, that when you go to process that claim, of course, it would have to have an ICD-10 code uh, to receive your reimbursement there. And so ICD-10 improves public health research, reporting, and surveillance. This is a, a very important topic and one that may uh, be familiar to you as you have a patient that comes in um, with uh, uh, a disease that requires you to report that to your public health agencies. And this is where an ICD-10 code would um, prove beneficial um, to be able to enter that new, um, uh, new disease it also allows you to um, report that um, through your public health agencies, which also ties into the registries and CDC reporting and uh, ensuring that um, uh, any outbreak uh, can be tracked and resolved. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a, a wide-scale view of where we see ICD-10. Um, many of you see it uh, with employers, healthcare payers, um, clearing houses, and of course providers here. And so the providers are really uh, reaching out and dedicating all of our resources, uh, or most of our resources, to reaching the small uh, physician practice group because we know that you have um, a, a, a very small staff, and um, you're first dedication, of course, is to your patients, and so we want to be able to supply you with the tools and resources to be able to help you become ICD-10 compliant, um, and, and of course not interfering with your uh, patient care. But we wanted to let you know kind of where you all sit in terms of the provider, the clearinghouses, and perhaps some of your other vendors here as well as payers. And ultimately, the beneficiary is impacted here as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and so let's talk a little bit about ICD-10 and the compliance here. Um, of course, improves accuracy of payment, and that's because it gets into more specific coding. Um, it, it gets into the nature and the cause and any type of correlation of the patient's um, disease. Um, it also... Um, enhances fraud, waste, and abuse prevention and detection. Um, it looks at um, better quality measurement, and we've talked a little bit about that with the physician quality reporting. It also helps researchers and others, um, health departments, um, look at public health issues. And it also provides that enhanced research and analytics that um, uh, are driven by ICD-10 or ICD uh, codes today. And the risk of noncompliance, of course, slow claims payment, improper payments, there could be errors, um, penalties involved as well. And so we want to uh, avoid this at all costs. We want to ensure that we focus more on the opportunities rather than the risk. Next slide, please. 
So here we're laying out a timeline for small practices. So you may be asking yourself, well, where am I today in terms of my ICD-10 implementation and where should I be? And so at this stage, um, you probably would have you know, looked across your uh, physician office and have identified those areas that you're currently using ICD-9 codes. And we can get into that a little bit more. We're going to actually walk through a physician's office and give you a sense of where you're going to find those codes. And so you probably have already done that. Uh, now is the time to really start to look at systems. So there are groups that are um, using uh, vendor tools right now to submit your claims. And if that's the case, you may want to start those conversations with your vendors. And we'll dive a little bit into that as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, let, let me tell you a little bit about where uh, CMS is today. So our Medicare implementation is on track. All of our systems are on target. We have about 76 systems that we're managing here. And we're conducting internal testing. With our states, we're offering technical assistance and training and also policy remediation to ensure that the states are moving forward with ICD-10 implementation. We're hosting a collaboration site where um, sharing best practices across the states. Um, so if we're finding something that's working in one area, we're trying to share that good news across with the other states um, and tracking and monitoring their progress. With providers, we're finding that many of the larger health plans, clearing houses, and large physician practices and hospitals are actually on target. Where we're finding that um, additional assistance is needed would be the small physician practices. And that's why we're really making an effort to offer that technical assistance also to your office. For vendors, we're hearing that some vendors are, are up and running, while others are starting to uh, ramp up their efforts and having discussions with their clients. So if you have not heard from your, your vendor right now, uh, please reach out to them and have some dialogue. And we actually have a set of uh, vendor checklist questions that we can share with you so that you can engage them in um, a productive dialogue. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we're getting into a little bit more about what we're doing with our state Medicaid agencies. I think this is important because you really need to have a good understanding of what's going on within your community um, and how we're reaching out to them. And you all also may be billing to Medicaid. And so, um, of course, we're having those online um, self-assessments. Uh, we're doing that quarterly. We're following up with them to see where they are. They are self-report, as a matter of fact. Um, one will be going out this week. It's due in about one to two weeks, and we should be getting some updates as to where the states stand for ICD-10. There's also an ICD-10 implementation handbook where we've recently updated that information. Um, the state ICD-10 collaboration site, we've mentioned that. Um, it's a great repository for information. We're actually um, uh, it's full of some rich data that they're using to discuss um, coding and um, strategies, best practices. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm skipping down to the last bullet there, um, they're developing uh, a list of 30 health conditions that have been of primary interest to the state Medicaid agencies. And what they're doing there is identifying um, some uh, coding examples and scenarios, um, and we're sharing that with some of, uh, some of the groups to uh, get some feedback, and it's still in draft, but we hope to have that ready to go um, by July to share with all. Next slide, please. And so here's where I'd like to walk you through. This is a great resource um, as well, and it, 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 it kind of shows the flow. So you're going to see an ICD code. Um, you know, you may be using it when um, to check to see if the patient is, is eligible. You may be using it uh, eligible and, um, in terms of their insurance. You may be using it when you're developing a problem list for the patient. 
you may be using it when a diagnosis has been determined, and of course, when you're sending that off uh, to, um, for payment to your provider or to your clearinghouse. And so, uh, just to lay out some of this, you'll see the lab, you'll see the billing, you'll see the coding, um, and, and how all of the ICD-10 information uh, comes together there. Of course, on your super bills as well, so keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Okay, so you may be asking yourself, okay, so now I know what ICD-10 is, I know sort of what's going on with, with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. I also have a good sense of, in terms of timeline, but I want to know how I should move forward. And so with that, these are the types of discussions that we think that would be helpful, but we're also open, open to hearing from you and how, um, what are your major challenges because we want to be able to reach out to you and um, identify some resources and tools that could assist you further. But initially, talk to your software vendor. Have those discussions. We actually have some links down here for you that identifies a vendor checklist. We also have um, a HIMSS uh, link there for their playbook, and it actually lists uh, several vendors who are ICD-10 compliant. Um, in no way do we support or um, condone any of these, <laughs> these groups, but we do know that HIMSS is a, a leader in the industry in terms of um, uh, uh, ICD-10 and along with PACOM, and so it does provide a list of vendors that they have determined to be ICD-10 compliant. So the next step here is the next box, talk to your clearinghouses, billing service, and payers. Um, one thing about clearinghouses that we wanted to let you know, and we've kind of heard this from uh, across the industry, um, many of you uh, may be familiar with um, uh, the 5010 conversion, and this is um, uh, this is the way by which you submit your claims. So for example, um, there was a conversion from 4010 to 5010 um, to upgrade the system. And 5010, which is the new platform, uh, was a way to bring the, the um, electronic processing of claims up to date with the healthcare industry. And, in, and with that, it was a prerequisite for, for ICD-10. The 4010 format could not hold ICD-10 codes. And so many, um, there was actually a, a mandate to convert and submit 5010 claims. So many of you may have already gone through that process. That was about a year or two ago. And so now as we're looking at ICD-10, we understand that clearing houses won't be able to play the same role as they did with that conversion. So right now you may be sending, in some cases, you may be sending a 4010 claim to your clearing house, and your clearing house then converts that to a 5010 claim. And then they send that claim on to your payer. And the payer processes and adjudicates the claims and sends uh, information back to you. Well, in this case, the 4010 is going to contain a ICD-10, excuse me, ICD-9 code. And so the clearinghouse is unable to take that ICD-9 code and convert it to a 10. Um, a couple of reasons for that is because this is probably the first time where um, uh, a clearinghouse has had to um, look at a code set and convert a code set um, versus a platform. So it's a little different. It could be construed as tampering with the claim um, or fraudulent claim. Um, as we know, the claims must have um, a diagnosis code uh, determined by the uh, physician and biller. Um, and so um, clearinghouse involvement in that um, is modifying the claim. 
And so in this case, if you're on a 4010 platform, you would need to uh, get a vendor tool that would convert that over for you prior to it going to your clearinghouse and or directly to your payer. Uh, we've heard loud and clear from clearinghouses that they will not take an ICD-9 code and change that over to a, an ICD-10 code for providers. So this is something that we really want to ensure that you understand. Um, and, and we've spoken to many of the, the large clearinghouses, and that has been their, their position on that issue. So identifying the changes your practice needs to make to convert. So that you know, a couple of questions that you want to ask your your vendors would be: um, Are my systems compliant now? And if they're not compliant, what products and services do you have to make it compliant? What are your timelines for making that compliant? Um, what type of training are they offering on the new systems, um, so that your staff, your internal staff, when using that system on the first day of October 1, 2014, that they're comfortable, that they're knowledgeable, and they know what to expect. And of course, we're going to make sure that you have um, the list here, but please check out that vendor checklist there and um, use that as a, uh, a resource guide. The next, uh, the next uh, item here is identify staff training needs. So a couple of training needs are going to have to take place. There may be systems training needs, and there also may be uh, just understanding the new code set. Um, the ICD-10 code set is very different from ICD-9, uh, and so um, it, it may require them learning a little bit more about the code set structure, um, also learning about uh, Crosswalking and mapping, and um, also having those conversations and discussions with you and the physician to ensure that they're sending through the proper um, codes. Internal testing. So we've talked a little bit about this. Um, this is where, if you're uh, changing your system, either your existing system or purchasing a new one, then you want to be able to test that system to ensure that it can process um, an ICD-10 code. It can process, meaning it can generate, it can receive, all of those things. And of course, conduct external testing with clearinghouses or payers to make sure that you can send and receive transactions, and most importantly for your, your benefit is to ensure that you're receiving payment uh, for your services. Next slide, please. As, so what we would like to do now is to walk into some of the um, modules, and um, I'm going to just touch on a few things here, and we're going to transition this over to uh, Kathy Vam in just a few minutes. So we have two video lectures that are on our website right now, and we've heard loud and clear, and uh, many thanks to PACOM again, <laughs> because um, PACOM has been very vocal and just a leader in making sure that CMS understands the needs of the small physician practice. And so what we've been able to do is to um, develop sort of this um, dialogue here, but also um, post a couple of things to our website, our training modules. Right now we're getting about 16,000 people per quarter um, using our, our online training. It's free. It includes CME credit, and so um, uh, anyone can take it. Physicians will receive the CME credit, but it's a great way to learn and get started on ICD-10. We are also developing uh, two new video lectures where we will not only have CME credits, but we will have nursing credits um, available to you. And we're really focusing on um, uh, areas of uh, great importance uh, specifically. I think uh, we hope to have PACOM be a part of that, um, an active part of that um, new uh, 
video lecture and, and, and module for you. Um, so we're really focusing around small provider groups. Next slide, please. And of course, we've developed several provider and payer implementation guides. And you know, one of the things that we um, have heard is that um, they're, they're good tools, but we really want to tailor something more specific, more hands-on, and in sort of bite-sized chunks for the small phys physician practice. I mean, it does have sort of your A through Z um, to get you started on ICD-10. Um, it is about 60 pages long, so what we want to do is to develop more checklists, more um, training aids, something that you can keep handy at your, your, your desk um, to help walk you through that process. So we'd be more than delighted to hear um, from you on that as well. Next slide. And of course, our resources here. And with this, I will actually turn it over to um, Kathy Viem. Um, we have a contractor supporting our efforts, and, and Kathy has been a wonderful addition to our team. Um, she's not only uh, working with CMS, but across HHS. And I'd like to have her continue the presentation. And towards the end, we'll be asking a few questions of you. And please, I see a, a number of questions coming through in the chat. And would be more than happy to hear what are the topics that you want to learn a little bit more about. We know that everyone is at a different level of implementing ICD-10. Um, so let us know what you'd like to hear more on. Thank you. Kathy? Okay, I think we're having a, a technical issue there, so I'll go ahead and continue from my end. Um, for ICD-10 website, please check out the website. We have um, a, some great tools there, and we're going to walk you through that in just a few minutes. We also have set up an ICD-10 questions mailbox, and we've done this for a couple of reasons. What we've heard is that you know there are there are a few questions out there stirring, and um, we are able to develop some frequently asked questions um, along the way. And so where we're hearing um, there may be some common themes or common questions, we're really trying to work to get those answers to you um, as, as soon as possible. And so please feel free to send in your questions there as well. The implementation guides that we've just reviewed, you'll see the implementation link there please go check it out. I will offer one other um, piece of information on that, is that we're looking to also develop more of an online interactive tool um, that can walk you through the implementation guide. Um, and so we're looking to tailor that to your needs as well. And we talked a little bit about the crosswalking and, and mapping. So here are some, some great links. As a matter of fact, um, we just got the 2014 GEMS uh, that just uh, hit the website. Um, and so we will make sure that we get those out to you as well. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, and so we have some additional um, Medicare Learning Network articles, and these are really great articles. We, a couple of the ones that have come out talks about some of the things that you all are interested in, which is, you know, how do I process a claim for ICD-10 um, and or and or ICD-9? So let me give you some examples. We, you all may be aware of that there will be a period of time that ICD-9 claims will continue to come in. What I mean by that is ICD-9 versus ICD-10 is going to depend on the date of service or the date of discharge for, for um, hospitals. So for example, if I have a claim that, um, well, if I have a, a doctor's visit, let's just say a doctor's visit, um, on September 20th of 2014, okay? So my, my, my um, 
I saw the doctor on that day, September 2014, which means that my claim is going to be an ICD-9 code, and that is correct. Now, that claim may be processed after the ICD-10 compliance date of October 1, 2014. So if I saw the doctor on September 20, 2014, and when I send in that claim, say I send in the claim November, let's say November 1, 2014, that claim should be an ICD-9. That is correct because my date of service was September 20, 2014. So there will be a period of time that those claims will still continue to process through the system. Now, let's give another, another example here. So let's just say I see the doctor, oh, let's see, December 1st, 2014. And my claim, my date of service again, December, 12th, uh, December 1st, 2014. And my claim is processed on February 1st, 2015. Well, in that case, the claim should come through an ICD-10 claim. And the reason being, it's my date of service falls after the October, on or after the October 1, 2014 date. And so I want to, to ensure that people understand that there will be a period of time where your ICD-9 claims will be coming through and based on the date of service. And that's absolutely correct. That's the way that um, the legislation, that is the intent of the le le legislation for October 1, 2014, and anything beyond that should be ICD-10. We're actually in the process of developing some scenarios around that for you, um, so you'll have that soon. And um, we're also developing some sort of crosswalk mapping examples as well. And there are examples only because we know that um, you know, when you identify an ICD-10 code, you really want to have, you want to look at it from a clinical perspective and you want to have your, your uh, bill or coder hat on as well as the physician clinical hat on. So, um, but certainly there are some examples out there. National coverage determinations. Oh, well, let me mention the ICD-10 national provider call. As a matter of fact, um, I, 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 I would welcome all of you to attend those calls as well. Um, we recently had one. It was about 12,500 people on the call. And this call is mainly focused for the Medicare fee-for-service provider. However, has great information about ICD-10, and um, it's an opportunity to also ask questions there as well. And we will keep uh, Karen and uh, your membership up to date on when the next call will occur. National coverage determinations, and so they are converting um, all of those over from 9 to 10 and um, that is on, on target and on track. Um, and there's some additional resources online, and I believe that we have some of the links here, yes. So please take a look at the national coverage determinations if you have any questions there or would like to get a little bit more around those topics. Let us know, and we'll make sure to include that in a, a future training. Medicare Learning Network, of course, materials. Um, you know, our our website has a host of information. What we've tried to do is to pull out those key links that we think that will get you started. Um, and so um, as we go through these training sessions, we will um, continue to um, provide you with those sort of key links. I know how... Um, stressful it is to go to a website and you're looking for something and you can't find it. So what we might want to do is put together sort of an ICD-10 check cheat sheet <laughs> for um, uh, links and resources for you guys so that you can have it handy right at your desk. Next slide, please. Okay. 
So here I'm going to walk you through a little bit through our ICD-10 website. Um, this is where all of the ICD-10 information is housed. Um, we try to link in all resources, so this is probably the best place for you to start. Um, and what I like most about it is that we have a provider resource section. Um, you have a checklist, you have guides, you have timelines, you have a lot of information there to kind of get you started. So please look into that. You'll also have the gyms here. And as a matter of fact, the 2014 gyms just came out. So that um, screenshot was taken before that, and that will be updated. And there's also an ICD-9 uh, Coordination and Maintenance Committee, which looks at those sort of coding issues that you all may have. You know, some of the um, uh, real policy issues around the coding. And so you may want to listen in on those meetings and calls, and all the information is here. As a matter of fact, all of the meetings have been posted to that area. So if you want to kind of catch up on the information, it's, it's a great tool and resource. Next slide, please. Okay. So in terms of next steps, I mean, we really want to be able to schedule a few webinars on your topic, topics of interest around ICD-10. Um, we're looking to schedule some regional training as well um, in areas um, that are, are near you. Um, if there are um, additional trainings that we're doing right now, we're trying to identify those and develop a schedule, so you may want to travel into one of them. The other option is we're going to be offering a few national calls. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity uh, to learn. We ho we're hoping to archive some of those calls to, uh, to, to video some of our training and put that on our website. Uh, we realize that you all work during the day um, and may only have a few minutes to go, kind of go through this training. So um, we're sensitive to that, and so we're looking for uh, looking at different options uh, for training as well. And again, as you're going through this process, you may find something that, you know what, it would be great if we had, you know, <laughs> X, Y, and Z. So, um, let us know. Let us know about that. I mean, uh, we, we want to hear um, from you as to what those things might be. Um, and we will explore every option. I, I can't say that we will do every option, but we will certainly explore every option um, and come up with something that we, um, together, that we think will work for you all. Um, and we'll certainly share it with the membership here. Next slide, please. And here's some contact information. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to us. I'm Denicia Green um, and Kathy Vian. There would be the lead for our noblest points of contact. And um, I guess now we can turn it over for a few questions I see that are coming up here. So I'll kind of start at the top here. Okay, where can I find information on documentation? And I'm thinking you're talking clinical documentation. Well, one of the things that we would like to offer to you all would be a training session around um, the ICD-9 uh, and 10 crosswalking and mapping, as well as the cl a clinical documentation review. Um, so if that's something that you all think would be helpful to you, we can certainly arrange that. Where can I find classes for our specific specialties? Um, this is a good one. You know, um, what we found is that, um, you know, for some of the specialties, um, some of the associations, professional associations, are offering those specialty classes um, around ICD-10. Uh, and we can provide a few resources for you. But depending on your specialty, they're generally offering something specific um, that will help you. And let me just say something about the specialty piece also. Um, you know, uh, we all have heard, wow, ICD-10, 
all of these codes. It's, it's going to be a lot of codes, and I'll have to kind of learn, you know, before I knew exactly which code, and now I have to kind of look it up or think about it a little bit more than um, before because it's a little, you know, it's a little different concept, and that's fine. You know, one of the things that we want you to keep in mind is that uh, for specialties, specialties are going to use probably certain codes, um, not all of the codes. They're going to use ones that are probably most specific to your organization. And, you know, as we're thinking about popula population health, you're going to use those codes and become familiar with the codes that are most relevant to your uh, patient population. And so, um, just keep that in mind. Uh, we know that there it is some work involved with the um, uh, implementation of ICD-10, but we know that together it can be done. Um, and so we're working with you to, to ensure it's sort of uh, one step at a time, if you will. And so there is still time between now and October 1 to uh, become compliant and to get your systems together and get your people on board. Um, and we know that um, it, you know you may have a staff of three or, uh, or a team of one, <laughs> and uh, understood. And um, uh, we want to be able to take that team of one and provide uh, you know resources, tools, information, um, get a list of sort of those pressing questions that we're hearing answer those for you uh, to, our, to, to the best of our ability um, and insist, assist you where we can. Let's see, we have a few other questions here. I'd like to make a comment if I could also, um, Denicia. Are sure. You there? Are you, okay, I wasn't sure if I was I'm on. I'm, I'm playing with my I'm mute here. button here. Okay, um, this is Karen over at Paycom. And I want to stress to practice managers out there that this is not we, – we are late on, on getting our heads around what we really need to be doing. The, the time for cushion is past. So, you know, not, not to stir a panic or anything like that, but to really seriously look at, you know, I'm not going to put this off until next month. I'm really seriously going to make some time to look at what is it I need to do for ICD-10. Am I in trouble? Do I have plenty of time? Do I have all the resources I need? Hey, let's look up some of these checklists that Denicia was talking about. You know, hey, let's look up this, this, this um, small to medium practice guidebook. Now is the time to try your best to use the resources that are out there and that are available. If you're not sure what they are, let us know and we'll direct you to that. But what we need to make sure of is that the resources that you have available are going to be useful to you. What some practices are finding is that when they finally decide, okay, finally we have time to look at this, they go to look at it and then they go, huh, what? And they close the door and they say, you know what, let's look at this next month. <laughs> you know, we still have some time. And that is a recipe for disaster. CMS is looking at small practice right now and saying, okay, what can we do to make it easier for practices to consume this information and get the right things done at the right time. If the information is overwhelming, if the information is not helpful, if the checklists don't relate to you, we need to know, okay? We need to know. My philosophy is that a lot of the stuff that's out there is great if you have a team and a lot of time to look at it. but. I feel that it can be broken up into smaller bite-sized pieces so that practice managers will use it. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know if the pieces out there are small enough for you to be using and you can say, you know what, yeah, we can work this in this week and then next week we'll take the next bite and then the week after we'll take the next bite. If that's working, then tell us, hey, this checklist over here, awesome. Let's do more of that. And by the way, this other checklist over here, what the heck were you guys thinking? Being polite and sitting back and going, well, you know, we'll get to it later. Or maybe I just don't understand. Or maybe I'm just missing something. No, you're it. We want to hear from you. This has to work for you. This has to be designed and, and consumable 
by small practice managers who are out there struggling every day, who don't have a project management team and a consultant working for them to do that. So this is you that we're talking to. We do want to hear from you. And thank you for letting me do my soapbox piece. I just can't, <laughs> I can't stress enough because what I see are people going, oh, yeah, well, I'll, maybe I'll, maybe maybe at my chapter meeting it will be sorted out or maybe my, you know, my clearinghouse will sort it out or my vendor says they had it taken care of. I and if you don't feel comfortable, step up and let's fix things so that you can. Because when you're comfortable and then your, your practice is successful in its transition, then you can be profitable and uh, we can move forward um, in a positive way. Anyway, thank you for letting me interject. Go ahead, Denicia. Absolutely. Oh, and I have a list I, I of all it. the questions, too. I have a list of all the questions I can, I can, I can um, type into your box there, Denicia, if you like. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, I'll Adam just also... Adam. I'll just also mention that, yes, everyone will get a copy of today's handout. I see that uh, question. Um, a, a couple of people have questions about that. Um, so, and yes, you will have those slides to print. Um, there's another question here. Is there a testing period that we can begin, begin using ICD-10? So, um, so Going back to that timeline slide, let, let's see here if I can get back a minute to pull this up for everyone. And I hope that you all are seeing the same thing I'm seeing. I'm looking at the ICD-10 timeline for small practices at a glance. So the, the, the implementation schedule that we're looking at is between now and the end of the year that internal testing, so this is where you look at your internal office and say, okay, if we're doing any systems changes, now's the time to begin testing those systems so you have a good chunk of time here to do that. That's internal. Now, from October 1st, 2013 on through the, up through the date of implementation, that's where we're designating external testing. And so you'll see on the left-hand side, the first piece is planning, the second piece says communications, and then you'll see our testing section. If you look at level two, which is our external testing, that is where that October 1st date, that's a key milestone date for you all to begin looking at implementation. And I think we had some a few other questions here. Okay, is there an estimated date for when the NCD, NCDs will be complete? Uh, right now we're looking at October 1, 2013 to, for completion of the uh, NCDs. Okay, there's another question here. I'm sorry, we're getting a little feedback here. Um, there's another question here about in the April issue of the Medicare newsletter um, indicates that ICD-10 will be accepted in 2013. Well, I can say that's probably a, a, a leftover. <laughs> it's probably an old, um, old material um, where, if you all remember, um, the ICD-10 um, delay happened uh, last year. And so many products were out there uh, showing the October 1, 2013 date as the implementation date. And so what we've been doing since that time now, since we have a firm date of October 1, 2014, we are going back through our materials, um, we're upgrading those materials, um, and for the Medicare newsletters, if it, it's the one I think you're talking about, they are re revamping those and including a message that says the new compliance date is October 1, 2014. So if you find something that's out there that has an incorrect date, please let us know. Um, they've updated uh, multiple documents, but if there's one or two that you still see, please let us know. We'll take care of that. Okay, so there's a question about um, 
an uh, EMR system, um, a medical electronic medical record, um, can you really be successful in using ICD-10 without having an EMR? Absolutely, because um, the I ICD-10 is, is you can use, well, you probably use that now, even you use an IC9 code now um, to process your claims. So you don't necessarily have to be on an EHR and you don't have to have an electronic medical record um, system. So um, it's ICD-10 is, is basically used as you're, as you're processing your claims. And we have another question here about uh, uh, does the ICD-10 manual change like ICD-9? Yes. So if you have an ICD-9 manual, you will now need an ICD-10 manual. Absolutely. Okay. And so there's a question here about um, um, when will Medicare accept an ICD-10 code? So um, by the legislation, we can accept an ICD-10 code on or after October 1, 2014. That is the date where we can accept um, and process an ICD-10 code. And um, I think uh, this person is referring to our Medicare uh, Learning Network newsletter and um, again so they're what they're doing with those are going back and putting um, a, a new uh, section in there that says the new compliance date for ICD-10 is October 1, 2014. October 1, 2014. So um, that's why you might see something out there that says 2013. There was a one-year delay, and um, one of the things that we will do is make sure that we send you some links to the legislation so that everyone will be clear on the compliance date. Okay, and so we have another question. I know we're coming to the end here. Uh, there are rumors out there that we will skip to 10 and go to 11. Is that a possibility? Um, no, it isn't. Um, We've, we've heard that as well, um, and uh, as a matter of fact, we are not um, looking to go to ICD-11. We're focused on ICD-10 and moving forward with the implementation date of October 1, 2014. Uh, there had been some um, discussions just across the industry, industry-wide, healthcare industry-wide, about whether ICD-11 would be an option. And um, quite frankly, we're far off, off from ICD-11. Um, it would take many years before that, just like ICD-10, um, and I see the conversion between ICD-9 and ICD-10 took many years. It would take many years before ICD-11 uh, would be um, an option. And so you may have seen something recently that's uh, sort of pulling that option off the table altogether. So, um, yeah, that is a rumor. Okay, let's see if we have other questions here. Okay, question here about will there be conferences that will show exactly how to do crosswalking from ICD-9 to 10. Yes, we can show some examples. Ultimately, it is still the same uh, process that you would decide today on uh, determining a code. But certainly, we can walk you through uh, the, the GEM mapping tool. It's a great way to crosswalk. We have the links included here. And also we can show you a, a couple of examples of how you might go about that. But ultimately your clinical decision and your billing encoders and, and your, your diagnosis would determine that. But we'd be more than happy to provide a few examples. Okay. And there I will stop to see if uh, anyone else has questions or thoughts, concerns. Karen? 
um, we can open the lines and, and see if anybody wants to, oh, here we go, certified coder question. And then somebody had asked, will there be conferences that show exactly how to do crosswalking? Uh, yes. From IC9 to 10. Absolutely, we'll, we'll have those. Mm -hmm. And if you're wondering how to ask a question, the way we have it set up today, because there are so many people on the call, um, is it's on the left margin of your screen, at the very bottom, there's a window for chat. And you should be able to type your question in there. And there, there's a question here that I'm seeing, and I, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. So it says, during the transition where ICD and IC9 and ICD10 could be, um, I, I guess, pro being processed at the same time, will the claims go through without being rejected for, for an incorrect diagnosis code? So I, I hope I'm understanding this correctly. So if it's based on date of service in your case. Um, in hospital setting, this date of discharge. Um, so let's let's say that if it's a if it's an ICD-9 claim that the date of service was prior to October 1, 2014, and the claim is processed after that date. It should be an ICD-9 code. That's as the legislation states. That is correct. Um, so um, the question here is, would it be rejected because of that? No, because our systems um, are set up to mimic exactly what the legislation has, which means that there is going to be a period of time when those ICD-9 codes are going to come through based on date of service. And so if it is before October 1, 2014, it should be an ICD-9 code. Those ICD-9 codes should come in and process without an issue. Now, if you have an incorrect ICD-9 code, it should reject because it's an invalid code. Um, and the same would happen if you submitted an invalid code today. Um, so yeah, you, you still have to have a correct code, um, but it would be based on date of service, and I, I, I hope I've helped to clarify that, but if not, uh, please let me know. Well, certif here's another one. Um, will certified coders be required to recertify with ICD-10 training? Well, you're not required to, but it is very helpful to your understanding of ICD-10. Um, there's a number of classes that are being held. Our CMS um, technical assistance and training does not include certification, um, although it is a very um, in-depth training. Um, but yes, there are a number of organizations like uh, AHIMA and AAPC and others that offer certified training. Um, so, and it's online, it's face-to-face, -face, it's a number of ways you can take it. Okay, let's see if there are others here, and then we have, oh, we're at the end, okay. <laughs> okay, let's see. So uh, here's another question. For ICD-10, do you need to be a certified coder? You don't have to be. It does not require that you are a certified coder. Um, but again, it's, it's helpful. It, 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 would, it would be helpful for you and your, your, your billers and coders to understand the code set. It is not uh, as simple as um, stating, well, I understand 9, so I can understand 10. It does require a little bit more um, depth to understanding the code, yes, but it is not required. I hope I've helped to clarify that question. Okay, let's see here. Looking for some other questions. Some of them are, are just reworded and repeats of others that you saw on there. Okay. What we can do as we're approaching 2 o'clock um, is go ahead and call, call it a day for this particular webinar, remind folks that 
we are going to be doing more of these and a lot of the material that's going to be covered will be based on the feedback that we receive from you around what you want to hear. And what we want to do is have you look at the materials that Denise has shared today and then tell us we like these, we don't like these, these are helping us, these aren't helping us, so that we can be more value to you around getting more focused education and training out there so that we can all be successful. Um, we also have an ICD-10 mailbox that we can get questions through. Um, there are some links in the presentation that tell you that information. You can also send them to KCOM. Um, you can send them to um, send them to me, <laughs> Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at paycom.com, and I will see that they get there, or there's uh, information in the presentation. The presentation is going to be available. We will send you a link to the presentation, so you'll have all of those slides. So is, this whole thing is also being recorded. There will be a video recording of the presentation so that you'll have all of the Q&A that we've been through as well. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it, we're all in this together. This is going to happen. We want to make it as painless as possible and uh, be as prepared as we can. And I personally thank each and every one of you for being here and making time um, to be the best practice manager you can at your practice and helping the industry as a whole move forward in a positive direction. And also thank you very, very much to uh, CMS, um, Denicia, for being here today, and also to Kathy, who um, for some reason I have to figure out technology here, why she wasn't able to come on. Uh, hopefully we'll get to see her demonstration in the next webinar. I apologize for that technical difficulty. Um, and with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Stay tuned. Thank you. Denise, anything else? Great, great question. Looking forward to talking with you all again. Uh, please uh, send topics of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.